Chris, if you wouldn't mind sharing your screen. We're good to go? We're good to go, yes. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, Steve, for the introduction there. Yes, today's session is about cooking up content. We've uh, broken it down into a four-step process. Um, there may be some questions. By all means, ask them at the end. Uh, if you've got a very specific question or a question specifically about uh, your own business, please just send us an email afterwards, and Steve and myself will be happy to answer that for you. Uh, there's also a couple of freebies that will be coming across with the email. Uh, we'll touch across those as we go through today's deck. Uh, but hopefully there's some things and some templates that will help make your content process much easier and smoother. So just before we start, these are just a couple of the clients that we've helped deliver content for, where we've helped Swinton uh, with content, JD Williams, Dulux, Booper, um, there's a lot of meta work that we do. We'll be touching on meta uh, as we go through this setup phase. Um, content can take many forms. Um, I will go through the different types of content we produce for each client, but uh, we'll touch on the different types available for you. But this is just a selection of uh, some of the clients we have helped in the past and are currently helping as well. Okay, so as I mentioned at the start, we've broken this down into a rough four step process. Um, the idea is that we're gonna give you a framework that makes it easier for you to come up with your own content marketing strategy. Uh, step one is all about the research. So this is understanding your existing content and your website, who your audience is and what works for your audience. Um, your competitors as well. Now, I know when we talk about competitor analysis, it's often usually just the dry numbers, but you can you can get a lot of content inspiration from your competitors. And it's usually a case of trying to do a bit of one-upmanship. Um, the next step is setup. So you do your research. What is it you then need to do with it? How do you pull this together into a plan that you can easily follow? You can get your teams bought in on, you can get the business bought in on, and you can demonstrate what it is you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, and when you're gonna do it. Number three is all about measurement. So there's little point pumping out content if you're not gonna measure it. Um, producing content and not promoting it or not being able to measure it is as bad as not producing content at all. So we'll look at some suggested KPIs. They'll obviously be dependent on what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, but we'll also give you a couple of ways you can make measurement a lot easier for yourself moving forward. And the final step is about refinement. So content only really begins once you've produced it and you've set it live. You might think that the research stage is taking a little bit longer than needed, but ultimately it's gonna help you in the long run. And when you've got your content out there and you've got some user analysis as to how people are interacting with it, you can then really understand how you can refine, redeploy and review your content. So it's not about from starting from scratch when you get to point four, it's about taking a step back, looking at what you've done, reviewing it, and then um, refining it to move forward. Okay, so step one, research. So before you begin writing any content, there's a couple of things that we always try and get our clients to understand. And it's, this is the five things that we always consider ourselves when we're doing it internally. You could go ahead, you could write as many blog posts as you want. You could write blogs on topics you think your audience are gonna be interested in, or on topics that you as a business may want to promote. But ultimately, if you don't understand what your users are interested in or engaging with, or what they're engaging with on competitor sites, you're just putting blog content out there into the ether, which may not be as effective as it could be. So we always say, start with these five topics here. Uh, and once you've got a better understanding of all of these, you'll be able to produce content that's more relevant to the audience and it's got a better chance of ranking higher up in Google. The higher up you rank, the more chance you've got of getting more visitors through to your website. So point one is understanding your existing content. So you may think that your existing content in your website may just be your blog. It's not. Um, if you think about any landing pages you've got or any non-product or transactional pages, they're all valuable pieces of content you've got on the site. 
by auditing them and seeing how people are interacting with them, things like average time on page, bounce rates, exit rate, you'll be able to see if you've already got some existing pieces of content that you could optimize further. And that's a quick win way of being able to say, all right, we've got this piece that's doing relatively okay. It was performing better last year, but we could improve it. Um, and there's a couple of ways you can do this in Google Analytics. So if you go to the behavior tab and then go down to site content, You've got four options here, and there's two that we always look at. One is all pages, and one is landing pages. Now, all pages will let you see the performance of any page on your website if the users visited it at any point in their journey. So they could have come into your website on the home page, contact us form, or a landing page, and then navigated through to that page. Landing pages is the page that a user lands on to start their session. It's important to take a look at both because both are different, measuring different things altogether. So keep those in mind. Um, in terms of the metrics you'll be looking at, you'll want to look at things like time on page, bounce rate, and pages per session. If you've got a landing page which has an average page per session of one and an average time on page of less than 10, 15 seconds, you probably need to address something on the page because users aren't interested or engaged with it. leads nicely on to understanding your users a little better. So there's a couple of things we look at with this usually, and what we'd always recommend is seeing what content works for your new users and what content works for your existing users. Now in Google Analytics, you can do this by going to the audience tab, go to behavior, and then new versus returning. Now what you will see when you go to that one um, initially is you'll just see two lines on there. One gives you some core stats for your new users and it'll be average time on page, perhaps rate and pages per session. And you'll get the same for your return users. What we can do in Google Analytics is add a secondary dimension and we would add landing page there. And then you'll be able to see for specific pages, what new users are interacting and engaging with and the same for returning users. This will help you see whether you need to tailor your content strategy for acquisition or retention. Um, it can be pretty powerful. It's just something to always keep in mind. What piece of content works for getting people onto your site um, may not be what works for keeping them on there once you've already got them. As I mentioned, competitor analysis is usually key. It's not about copying them though. It's about understanding what competitors are doing and building on it. So you'll be looking for things like, do they have more call to actions on their landing pages or do they have logic-based triggers? Um, by logic-based triggers, I mean, do they have pop-ups uh, that appear when it looks like you're about to go off-site? Um, the other thing you want to consider is, do they use different taxonomy to you? Uh, the one thing we sometimes find quite a lot is what taxonomy is used internally when you're talking about specific things may not be what your users are using. Uh, when they're in Google search. So we always say uh, website users are dim. They're dumb, impatient, and methodical. So you need to put things in plain English um, to rank better in Google and get more people through. Have a look at what competitors are doing and if they're doing that. You can pick a couple. Um, I would say you only want to be looking at two or three. You might want to review it every quarter or so. Um, and if your competitor set changes, adjust it accordingly. But look at things like the amount of keywords they're using on pages, how long is the copy they're producing, what call to actions are they using, and what type of content are they doing? Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of people tend to think of content as blog. What you may find with your competitors, if, um, if they've got a bigger budget, is they'll be investing in bigger pieces of content. That's not always realistic, but you can invest strategically and smartly with your content as well. It also gives you a good benchmark and baseline as to this is where our competitors are. We need to be a little bit further on. Them. And it's pretty easy to just keep a spreadsheet and track them. The other thing you can do is target specific long tail search queries. So search queries are what users put into Google in order to find your website and find content or the answers they're looking for. The longer a search term, the more likely they are they're willing to commit or the closer they are to make a purchase get a quotes or whatever your uh, conversion metric is for your website. You can do this in a couple of ways. So 
I often use Google Search Console. It's a tool I use quite a lot. Um, and I'll show you in a second how that looks um, and where you can find the search queries. You might have noticed if you ever use Google Analytics that if you're looking at organic data, it doesn't give you the keywords that someone comes into your website on. Google Search Console will give you the search queries that your website appears for in organic search. So it's quite a powerful tool to use. The one thing I would say though is that as great as it is, it's not the most user friendly, although they have made improvements in recent months. Um, but combine the data from there with tools like your own website's site search, uh, Moz, SEM Rush, and Google Keyword Planner. It'll help you build a more rounded view of the keywords that your website appears highly for, and it'll give you a basket of keywords that you can track against. So you're getting your KPIs. We know these keywords are what we want to be targeting, and we can produce content that targets these specifically. So if you've never used Google Search Console, this is what the interface looks like. And I've told you the path there you can view the queries on. It's pretty powerful. It, um, but again, don't use it in isolation. Use it with one of the other tools that we've mentioned. So if you go to the performance tab on the left-hand side, you can filter the date range, um, whether it's last three months or 90 days or 30 days. Um, and then you get the queries there. You get the number of impressions your website appears for and the number of clicks that your website has generated for that specific search term. Really useful, just use it with another tool. And then the final one is probably the biggest one, but the way users use Google and search engines is becoming very much query based. Think about how you yourself probably use Google. I bet the majority of searches you do are around the knowing searcher. So this is when people ask questions a lot of people use it, and these questions are the how, the what, the why, the when, the where. Any sort of question or information searching on Google is an area where you want to be producing content for. There's a couple of free tools you can use, uh, and we'll touch on two of those in a moment. But the one thing I would say is consider your own customer service team if you have one. They are likely to receive a lot of queries in, in the contact centers, um, either by email or on the phone. And what you may find is that they get asked questions repeatedly. Um, and rather than having them constantly refer back to the same answers on a script, take that information and produce a piece of content on it. That's one example you can use. Not only is that gonna make the user experience better because the answer they're looking for is on your website without them having to contact someone, but it also demonstrates to Google that you're an authority on the subject, you're producing regular content, and it also means that your customer service team can probably deal with actual issues that the website can't deal with. The one thing I would say about answering a question is, and I use this example from uh, money advice services, even if the question and the answer seem very dumb, remember users are dim. So the example here is, does a car have to be insured? It's a dim question, but I can guarantee that people are asking it and there's a lot of search terms search queries for it. If you're not answering the dim questions, people are gonna be going elsewhere to find the answers. Um, it's better to answer a dim question and have them come through to your website than not. So the other two tools we mentioned are also asked and answer the public. And this is what also asked looks like. It's a great tool um, and you'll notice whenever you do a Google search, you usually get a paid ad underneath in Google. You usually get a featured snippet which is pulled out uh, from Google. And then you also get a section underneath it called People Also Asked. People Also Asked is one of those um, expanded drop-down lists. And the Also Asked section is all those questions that appear. So if we look here, if I'm searching for doc insurance. What it's gonna do is People Also Asked, Google will come up with how much does it cost to insure a dog? What's the best dog insurance? Is it worth getting a pet? insurance, should I insure my dog? Again, some of these questions may seem dim, but as I mentioned, if people are looking for these questions, you want them to be coming through to your website rather than somewhere else. So you can, these are all clickable um, when you use this tool. Uh, if you click on one, it will then give you the expanded list of related questions. But you can export this into a CSV file and you've now got a list of frequently asked questions that you can produce and answer questions for. 
The other one is Answer the Public. You may have heard of this one before. It's been around for quite a while. It's been updated quite a few times. But as we were talking before about the knowledge-based search queries, what you want to do with this is take the how, the what, the why, the where, which, will, who questions, the knowledge seekers, and this will give you all of the questions relating to a specific search term. So dog insurance in this instance, it gives you these questions. You can export it into a CSV. Um, the one thing I would say though is, as with all of these free tools, you need to review it before you use it. There'll be a little bit of overlap. Some of the questions it generates may be slightly redundant, and there's usually quite a lot of Americanizations in here that aren't relevant to the UK market. But it's still a valid tool. Combine it with also asked and your customer service team, and you've got a great bank of content there already. Okay, so there is also a bonus piece of content, and this is one that we use quite a lot, but it's often overlooked, so we call it our secret ingredient. It's uh, Google Trends. Um, you may have heard of it, you may have used it a couple of times. It's not a tool that often gets remembered or picked up on particularly well on its own. It doesn't work particularly well on its own either, and I think that's possibly the reasons why. If you combine the data you get with Google Trends with a tool like SEM Rush, uh, Moz, Search Console or Keyword Planner, what you'll get is a holistic view of seasonal trends and user intent on when people are searching for specific terms. So if I was using Google Search Console, what I would be looking at is the queries that my website appears for over a certain period, say 90 days. What I would then do is I would look in Google Trends over the same time period, input the same search query that I found in Search Console, and I would then see if there was any peaks that I've either missed or I've hit. And I can then use that for forward planning for content in the next quarter or the next quarter after that. You can also combine it with your own website's on-site search. Um, we don't touch on this in this deck, but you're not sure if you've got site search set up your website, ping Steve and myself an email and we can help you sort that out. Again, this will help you produce content that's gonna be relevant and timely to your audience. And we've got an example of how we've used it with clients in the past. So we used a client's on-site search data over a 12 month period to find out what keywords were appearing frequently, but they weren't doing a great deal with. In this case, it was cashmere scarves and what we found was it was the top three or is in the top three searches every month on the website. And it was generating a good amount of revenue for the client. But what we also did was we took data from Google Trends over the same 12 month period and tried to isolate when people were actually looking for cashmere scarves. You may be surprised or not, that it's usually Easter, Mother's Day, August Bank Holiday, Black Friday, and the last week before Christmas when people are panicking, thinking, oh, I've forgotten to get a present. So what we were able to do from that was build out a content strategy for the website. So around these key periods when Google Trends has said to us, there is a higher chance that people are looking for cashmere scarves at these specific points. We had homepage takeovers. We had increased prominence in the navigation. We produced more blog content and buying guides. Uh, we also made sure that it was promoted on email and social media. So it was taking two sets of data, Google Trends backed up with on-site search, producing this content that can be used at multiple times throughout the year. And ultimately, we were able to double the revenue that they generated each month. So they went from doing 4,000 to 5,000 a month over a 12 month period to 10,000 a month. Small change, but without having done the research and being able to isolate this down, we weren't able to make that recommendation or make the improvement. Okay, so that's a whistle stop tour of the research you can do to plan out your content. Next thing you'll be asking yourself is, I've got all this information, it probably feels a little bit overwhelming at this point. What do I need to do with it? What's the next step? Now, probably the easiest thing you can think of when producing content is a blog post. That's not necessarily the right piece of content though for your audience, it's, it's an easy quick win. There's a lot of different types of content available to you. Now, if I was asking you about types of content you may be thinking of, you'd either be thinking of these huge campaigns that have hundreds of thousands or thousands spent on them, 
which can produce content that will last an entire year, or you will be thinking blog posts, but there's a lot of stuff that fits in between. Um, what we like to do is find that middle ground between just doing a blog post and having budgets that are going to get you something that's truly noticed. And bring it together though, and if you start thinking about your content in terms of copy, imagery, downloads and video on your website, that starts getting you on your way. It's not just blog posts, it's any piece of content you've got on there that people may find useful. A good place to start though is the periodic table of content marketing. You might have seen this before. Um, it's been around for quite a while. This is the latest version that was updated a couple of years ago. Um, so what we would always say or recommend you do is take a look at the various types of content that you've got available. Now they list them all here. So I'll go through a couple of examples um, just to get you thinking. If you think of a glossary of terms for your industry, you may be thinking, well, we already know this, our customers already know this, but Google doesn't know that. So what we would say is do a glossary of terms because what you'll be saying to Google then is, we've added this 2,000, 4,000 targeted keyword piece of content onto our website that demonstrates we're an authority in this space. People will still find it useful. Um, it may not be your existing customers, but you may get new customers. And at the same time, you can be ranking better because you've got this targeted keyword piece of content on your website that Google is gonna like. Google loves content, it's pretty greedy when it comes to it. The more you can add to your site, the better. Other things you could look at are things like Ask the Experts. So this is great for a number of reasons. You've you can allow your users to interact with you directly. So you could use it as a social tool. Um, you could host a Q&A session on Facebook or Twitter, whichever is your preferred platform, or you could host a live video on your website itself. So not only are you gonna be producing content about this um, Ask the Expert session, but you're gonna be getting direct engagement from your users. People love giving you their opinions or their questions, so I can guarantee it's something that usually works. But it also give you user generated content because all of these questions you answer or all of these comments you get from people can be repurposed and reused multiple times. Linkbait is another great example. Um, you're probably very familiar with this if you've ever been on Buzzfeed, Mashable, or if you've got yourself stuck in the Daily Mail sidebar of shame. It's, um, it's the type of content that's sensational in the headline and it's a pretty standard article throughout. People love it though, it's the type of content that gets shared on social media an awful lot. News tracking is an easy one and it's one that often gets quite overlooked. So what we sometimes recommend doing is if you set up a Google alert on news uh, for some specific search terms that you're targeting, again, think back to your research phase where we're identifying the long tail keywords we want to produce content for. You'll then get an email from Google whenever a news article is produced about that keyword. And what you can do is you can then embed that article on your blog, top and tail it with a piece of introductory content and a closing piece of copy. And then you've got a piece of content on your website that's relevant, it's timely, and you can publish out to social media and get people's comments on it. You can ask them to share, ask for their opinion. It's a piece of content that will take about 10, 15 minutes to produce because all you're doing is you found a piece of news that's relevant, put it on the site, and you're asking for people's opinion. And nine times out of 10, you'll get a lot of comment and debate, and you might even get some controversial opinions. Not a bad thing. You're at least showing that you're timely and relevant. The other thing to remember with um, news tracking is producing content isn't always about creating it from scratch. You can curate it, and that's fundamentally what news tracking is. How to content also works really well. So if you think again back to the information seekers that we talked about with the FAQ content and the research phase, these are people who are gonna be putting into Google, how do I, how do you, how does? So that guide-based content will always work well. Okay, so from that, we've got you thinking about the content you can be producing. You've got a better understanding of what works well on your website, what doesn't what your audience responds to, what your competitors are doing, and the types of content you can be producing. Now this slide is all about bringing this all together into plan, 
that you and your teams can use makes it really easy. Now, this is one of the first freebies that we're going to be sending out today as well. So it's essentially, it's a calendar. Um, what we want you to do with this is think about content in a simplified way. So it's broken down. Like this. Five dates of when we want to be saying and when we want to be saying it to our audience. Next, we've broken down the various types of content you want to be producing. So with this, it's, it's very simple. And um, we've put some examples in here. You can change these around as much as you want. And it's just a tick list of yes, whether you're going to, what type of content it fits into. The other thing we've done with this is we've created a tally at the bottom, which you can probably see here. This will help you when it comes to the measurement and refining phase, because what you can do then is say, right, well, from the four articles we produced this month, we can see that we drove an additional X amount of users through to the website, and they had a bounce rate of 60%, which is below the site average. That's great. You need to do more of that content moving forward. Next step is one that's probably overlooked the most, and that's how you're promoting your content. So this is quite a key thing. If you produce content and you don't promote it, you may as well not produce content at all. You need to be thinking about how your audience are gonna find it. Yes, you've got Google, but you can't just rely on organic Google search. Think about your social media platforms and where you talk with your audience. Also think about things like email. And um, if you've got a big piece of content like a how-to guide or a Q&A session, or you've got a new glossary on there, that might warrant sending out an email just about that. If you've got a series of blogs, probably not, but you could include a panel about the blog on an existing email that's already going out. And then the last section on this sheet is just about whether you're putting a budget behind it. So if you're gonna be promoting it, how much are you gonna be spending on it? Are you gonna be boosting on Facebook? And whose responsibility is it? So if you work with an agency or you work with a large team, you might want to create a drop-down list here of whose responsibility it is to get it produced and then confirm whether it's live or not. This will then make sure that you've got a full audit of what content you're going to be producing, when you're going to be producing it, the type of content it is, how you're going to promote it, and who's responsible for it. So hopefully that gives you a good way of managing your content. Because I think probably the thing we hear the most is we have a lot of ideas, but we don't know how to bring it together into one format that's easy to understand and easy to follow for anyone in the team. The other thing you wanna be considering is how your content's gonna appear in search. Now I said that search isn't the only place you should be promoting content, but fundamentally, if you've got a page on website it's going to appear in google but what you really want to do is you want to be able to control how google displays that piece of content or the landing page to your users the better you make this um meta the more likely are you are to get people clicking through to your website so it's quite a powerful thing and there's an example here from money penny so there's three things that you can control and you can ask google to um display for you one is the title, so the title here. You've got the display URL as well. So although you've got a URL and you can say to Google, we just want to shorten it, make it very concise, and you can control that. And then you've also got the meta description. Now you might be thinking that this looks really good. Well, yes and no. There's a couple of things to look at here. So what Moneypenny have actually done is they've said to Google, down here at the bottom, this is what meta description we would like you to display. There's a good meta description because they're talking about a free one week trial there. But what you can probably see is that Google's overridden meta description and they've replaced it with what they think is more valuable. So it's not talking about the free trial, which is a wasted opportunity. In that instance, what you wanna do then is revisit your metadata for that landing page. If you've got a page that's talking about a free trial to try and encourage new users through to your website and your metadata is not talking about it, you're not going to get people through to your website and that's what we want to happen. So 
three things for metadata. Um, as I say, we'll have all of these on the slides as well, but we've got another freebie coming up that will really help. Um, so for title, these are the character lengths you want to be aiming for. Use natural language. Again, think about your taxonomy. If you're using an industry term that your users don't, don't use it. Put it in the glossary, yes, but use terms that people are actually searching for. And we've told you the tools that you can use to research that earlier on. Think about your meta description as well. So this is your opportunity to really say to Google, this is how we want to promote this page or this piece of content. Put a call to action in there as well. If Google overrides it, rewrite it, resubmit it, and see if Google displays that. And then the URL, as I mentioned with the money penny example, is clear, concise. Make sure it's really obvious to a user where they're gonna be clicking. So this is where Excel can be a really good friend for you, um, unless you're Public Health England, but you can use a Glen um, formula, which will give you the character count for a cell. Now, maybe thinking, well, that's fine, but I've got a lot of metadata to write. So this is why we produce this sheet, which is available for you to use. There are a number of tools you can um, use. One is Screaming Frog, that'll allow you to export all of your meta titles and descriptions and then you can put them into this sheet and then you can rewrite them. What I would recommend is put in your current meta titles, see how it stacks up in terms of the character count. It's conditional formatting in here as well. So if it's not green, it's not as optimized as it could be. And then rewrite your meta title and your meta description. But keep this as a sheet. It's a good benchmark to see whether Google's either overridden it or if you've been able to improve your click-through rate from search. The other thing to consider is there's more to meta than just titles, descriptions, and URLs. You've also got things like Open Graph, which is used particularly on social media, um, where you can specify images, favicons, uh, keywords, if your website is displaying an event. Won't go into all of those. I would say that's the next step beyond, but you really want to be making sure you've got the basics of meta right for your website. No point producing content. Google is not going to promote it how you want it to be seen. Next key thing is you want to be able to measure exactly what you're doing. So if you've spent all this time doing this research and you've then spent budget and money and time and team resource on producing content, how are you going to prove that this piece of content has been successful? So you need to set some clear KPIs for measurement. Make sure that they're relevant though for the type of content you're producing. So if you're looking to drive new users with a how-to guide, uh, look at things like the number of new users, bounce rate, and number of pages viewed per session. Things like uh, a video, you won't be tracking KPIs like that. You'll be looking at how far into a video they reached before they left, or did they watch it all the way through? If you've got a gated piece of content, how many download requests did you get for it? Is the gate itself a barrier? Could you open it up? If you don't consider things like this or your exit or bounce rate, you've also got to consider other things like, what is it you want someone to do when they're on the page? These KPIs are great. They're really gonna help you, but what is it you want someone to do on site? So if you've got a insurance website, you'll be wanting them to get a quote. If you are a retailer, you'll be wanting them to make a purchase. So happy content have your KPI for the content, also have a goal of what you want them to do on that page when they're there. Ask a user to do something. Remember, users are dim, uh, dumb, impatient, and methodical. So you have to kind of almost lay out the breadcrumbs for what it is you want them to do and where you want them to go. Okay, so in order to make measurement a little bit easier for yourself, you can, you can work smarter and make reporting easier. Now we use Google UTM strings, and Google has a tool for that, and we also have a free tool you can use. If you're creating a campaign to promote a product launch, it's easy to understand where your traffic's coming from because it's, it's a large campaign. If you're producing regular content though, you can use UTM strings to really understand how a email performs or how social media post performs. And you can create a custom report in Google Analytics based on UTM strings as well. What's better, you can then set a daily or weekly or monthly report based on these. So you just get these reports sent to you in a PDF format from Google with all your KPIs. 
things like page view, uh, bounce rates, exit rate, time on page, pages per session. And this is the tool that Google has that should help you. Now, it's not the friendliest or easiest to look at, but there's four things that you need to be mindful of. One is the website URL. So where are you going to send people? The next one is source. So source is where the users come from. Are they coming back from a newsletter? Are they coming from Google? Is it a quote not taken up? Are they a lapsed customer? The next one is medium. So how are they getting to your website? So think about things like email, social, display, retargeting. And then name is the custom one that you're dropping yourself. So what's the unique identifier for this piece of content you've produced? Just remember, you can't use spaces in here, so use an underscore if needed. And you can do one URL at a time with this tool from Google, or you can use the free sheet that we've built for you. So what you do here is you just specify your source medium name in the top right. You input your links and URLs in the left-hand column. And then what the right-hand column will do is it will give you the URL with all the tracking applied to it. In this instance, we used it predominantly for email, but we also use it for content and social media posts. This will also give you a bank of URLs with tracking in. So if you ever want to go back and see what tracking URLs you've done before, you've then got it in one place. And again, you can't use spaces, use underscore. And I would also recommend double checking the URL when it's output it into the right column just to make sure it's working. You'll see very quickly in Google Analytics in real time view if it's successful. And I will repeat this again, but measure absolutely everything. Um, the very basic understanding you'll need from measurement is Google Analytics. It's um, the easiest and most common way of tracking core metrics for a page, your content and site performance. As I said, you can automate some of it for you, particularly if you use UTM strings, which will make your job much easier. And you've then got that daily, weekly or monthly, however frequently you need it, resource that you can always go back to. Google Search Console, earlier, if you do the organic search queries your website appears for, you can see um, how frequently you appear for it. If you want to take it a step further, there is also Google Tag Manager. Uh, Google Tag Manager, though, is a custom piece of tracking and measurement. It's a self-contained container where you can input specific tags and measurement tools. So I use it for clients by tagging up certain buttons uh, certain clickable elements or certain page views. So it's taking it to another step. You can get training from Google on it, or you can speak to us if you've got any questions on Google Tag Manager. But consider it a three step um, strategy there. Always have Google Analytics to measure everything. If you want to take it a bit further and analyze how you're appearing in Google Search, most of all, go to Google Search Console. And if you want to get down to the very nitty gritty of how your website's performing and and being used by users, take it another step further in Tab Manager. Another good example for Tab Manager is um, one that I often use for clients is tagging up navigation. So seeing how every single click in a user's dropdown and on a website's dropdown navigation performs. It sounds quite niche, and it is, but we actually use it to prioritize how um, a website is optimized how we lay out the navigation and what options we present to users. What we as an agency, what our clients think should be the priority for a navigation is sometimes going to be very different to how users actually interact with the website. But that is going to a very, very detailed way of uh, navigation. And then finally, you do get to the refining stage. So this is where you want to promote, analyze, and repeat may think when you produce your content, that's it, job done. It's not. It's actually probably when the job starts. If you've produced a excellent how-to guide that's 1,500 to 2,000 words long, how are you going to promote it? How are you going to get it out to people? Could it be a PPC site link? Or if it's a bigger piece of content, could it be an actual campaign itself on um, search? 
Could it be a service email or split? Again, think about back to the calendar where we've got the promotional tab there. How will the piece of content work on social media? If you've got an FAQ page, you could split those pieces out. If you've got a long series of blog posts, you may split those into smaller chunks. Again, uh, you may split up a bigger piece of content into smaller bite-sized pieces, particularly if it's a gated piece. You might want to gate the whole document, but then what you might want to do is release one section of it on the blog once a week. So those who want to get the entire thing right at the beginning, they need to give you something for it and that's their data so you can then contact them. Whereas if people are happy to wait, they can just view it on the blog over six, seven weeks. The other thing you'll want to do, and this is one that also often gets overlooked, is how will business stakeholders know about what you're doing? And how are they going to use this content themselves? Take it straight back to that calendar. If you've produced this content calendar that says, on this day, we're going to be producing this piece of content, it's this content type, this is how we promoted it and where it's live, you've then got this uh, plan mapped out, the entire business, everyone's aware of it, everyone's got visibility, and you can avoid any shocks or nasty surprises. And as I said, uh, in truth, once you produce your content, that's when the job's just beginning. User habits change continually, how people interact with search changes. Competitors also change what they're doing. What you may find is that they flip how they do content, they may produce something different, they may produce something new. So in those instances, what you want to be doing is saying, right, we've had this piece of content up, our competitors have done something similar to try and beat us, what do we need to do that's going to position it slightly differently? So you might be doing an updated version of it, you might be doing 10 of the best rather than five, which they've done. Just think about how you can always track what they're doing and do something a little bit better. It doesn't have to be reinventing it from scratch, it's just updating your content refining it, um, redeploying it, and repeating that process again. Don't start from scratch, use what you've got, use it more efficiently. Okay, so in summary, I'm gonna go back to this slide. I hope we've shown you that research stage one is probably one where you'll be spending a lot of time at the beginning, but it's also one of the most valuable places uh, to spend your time at the start. By understanding what works well on your site, what doesn't, what your new users and existing users interact with most, and what your competitors are doing and what the keywords are, you'll be able to isolate and more efficiently develop content in stage two when you come to set up and producing a calendar. You'll be using your time and your budget more efficiently. Um, you could just do a series of blogs, you could just keep producing blog content, but what value is that if it's not what your users are interested in? I'm not saying blog content's not valid, it is, but there's a lot more there that may resonate more with your audience and it may get you more new users through to the website. So think about what your audience respond well to. I won't underestimate this and, sorry, I won't under egg this, but always measure exactly what you're doing. Use Google UTM strings and make sure you've got those reports set up in Google Analytics. Make sure you've got the metadata correct for your site as well. If you're not promoting your content to the best of your abilities, Google will take a stab at it, but you lose control over it. And if you can't prove how your content is uh, generating new users or whatever your KPI is, you're not gonna be able to prove the value of investing in content moving forward. And that's one of the key things you need to be able to do if you want more budget or you want to produce more content moving forward. And then finally, Always refine, so review, refine, and redeploy. Not about starting from scratch all the time. Just ask yourself the questions of the content we've produced, what's worked, why, what didn't work, and why. Make an adaption, make a tweak, do an updated version, add more tips, or split an existing piece into bite-sized chunks. One of the easiest things you can do is, particularly if you've got something like a, a guide, so, how to apply for a blue badge is an example with a client we've had recently. We always have a 2019 edition, 2020 edition, 2021 edition. So same piece of content, but fundamentally it gets updated. It's also a series of content that users expect, they get used to seeing it. 
I really look forward to it. So not reinventing the wheel, a lot of work done in stage one, stage two is going to make step three and step four considerably easier for you. Okay, and that's about it for me. Thank you very much, Chris. That was fantastic. Really enjoyed that session. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, um, we will be sending you a link to the recording of today's presentation. Um, so I'll open the floor up for questions. Just uh, taking the presentation now. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Okay, so yeah, as I said, just want to keep up another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, any questions that may come in. Um, reminder, um, next week we have Adrian Rowe and um, Andy Craig talking about um, Google Shopping um, and giving, um, giving you their, their top tips um, and hints for maximizing and optimizing your Google Shopping campaigns. Um, I appreciate it's not necessarily um, apt for all sectors, um, but you hopefully will pick up some some interesting um, bits and bobs that could potentially help you um, with um, other channels potentially as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I do apologise. Um, okay, so let me just double check if there are any questions. <coughs> Anything coming through at the moment? As Chris said, um, I think we have a question from David Lloyd. Can you hear me? Yes, David, yes, question. Hiya. Oh, yeah. um, of late, I've been wondering whether the days of having a ring-fenced blog where all the longer pieces of content sit is perhaps less sophisticated now, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about having these sort of how-to pieces or guides weaved more um, uh, thoroughly throughout the website rather than in a ring fenced area such as a blog. Sometimes if someone you know, thinks I don't want to, I'm not in a position now to want to read a blog, yet they would if that how-to content was provided to them in the funnel, they would read it and get some value from it. So sort of finding better ways to kind of integrate content into the main body of the blog, of the site rather than in a blog. Your thoughts on yeah. that? Absolutely. I think that's a, it's a very valid point. I think, um, Blogs have fallen in, in favour, particularly over the last few years. Particularly if you start thinking about specific types of content, how-to content is a great one. But it's the sort of content that warrants being in your own site's navigation itself, not tucked away elsewhere. People aren't going to find it. But if you use a tool like Tag Manager to then track how many people you get through to a how-to guide from the navigation, you can really justify the investment in producing content and moving it so it's more front and center. Ultimately, people are gonna come through to your website because they want the answer to a question, they want to know something. So the easier you make it for them, because they're dim, dumb, impatient, and methodical, the better experience is gonna be for them when they get to your site. So yeah, I would bring as much content forward that's relevant as you can, but track how it performs when you do bring it forward. Cool, thanks, yeah. I don't know about Tab Manager, I'll look into that. It's, it's very powerful. It's um, it's a way of deploying tags and tracking always needing a developer to do it. Um, if something goes wrong as well, it also means that um, it's not gonna break the website. Um, if you deploy tracking code natively, it can slow your website down. But if something breaks on it natively, um, it can also break the website. Tag Manager is a lovely self-contained container. If something goes wrong, the website will still function. It's just you lose the functionality within it. Um, but if you've got any questions on Tag Manager or need a hand, just give myself an email. I've got my Google certification in it. I can't say it's the most exciting of tools to use, but it's um, very powerful when it is used. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for the question, David. <coughs> okay, if there are no further questions, I will uh, close today's session. Um, as I said, I will send over an email later on today. With a link to today's session and of course um, the freebies that um, Chris mentioned during the course of his presentation today. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for attending as per normal, guys. I uh, really do appreciate the support on this, in this initiative. Uh, but thank you very much. And without further ado, I will close today's session. Thank you very, very much, much, everyone. Have a good day.